I'm Glenn Denny and welcome to another edition of Circle Time, the earliest podcast. My guest for this edition is a consultant and trainer with over 25 years of experience in early years. They specialize in creating nurturing environments for children's growth and development using their vast experience as a trauma-informed practitioner. Welcome to Circle Time, Teresa Robinson. Thank you, Glenn. I'm really excited to be here. So I appreciate you having me on. Oh, thank you. No, we, we yeah, really pleased to have you with us. So First of all, tell us a little bit about your background and where you've kind of started from and, and to where you are now, really, your sort of journey. Well, I started in early years, 25 years ago as a parent helper and uh, just sort of found my way in the sector. I didn't actually seek it out. I just found my way in the sector because my daughters were small and I was in a small preschool, started to help out. Then I started to train. I ended up running and managing that preschool uh, and then it just sort of evolved from there. And then I ended up 25 years later, uh, a nursery lead in a primary school in Devon. Um, so wow. it's been, yeah, quite quite a journey, but not one I specifically chose. It just evolved. Yeah. It almost chose you, really, didn't it? It did. It did. Yes, most definitely. I didn't expect it. I didn't know 25 years ago that this is where I would be now. Yeah. No, it's interesting. So for me, it was like, I always, this is what I wanted to do. Um, but it's, it's interesting. You were kind of like the the usual kind of thing, like the parent helper brought in and then, yeah, just worked your way through it. But, Absolutely. And it just became um, an absolute passion mm -hmm. and it never waned. It just, it just got stronger. And I think because you, you grow and you develop and as you evolve in your role and in your practice, however, you know, all the various roles that you undertake, it exposes you to new experiences and you want to look into those more. And then because I am a bit of a nerd anyway, it sort of really fed into that for me. And I was able to sort of explore things that I found incredibly interesting and then just took myself on. And, and now I'm here now and founder of No Pets Are Required. Yeah. I, I love that name because honestly, the amount of times you're like, yes, we'll get the children to do worksheets and like, no, please don't. <laughs> I have nothing against pencils. I absolutely love all writing implements, I have to say. But I do believe that actually if you want really successful uh, lifelong learners, then it's all those important skills that come before they even need to pick up a pencil. Absolutely. You know, it's all those really, if you get those foundations right, then you have motivated little learners who want to do the best. Yeah. Absolutely. So one thing I was I was kind of interested in is like the, the trauma informed practitioner part that, you know, I was reading about for you. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, that came off the back of um, my own personal journey of exploring and becoming a life acc accredited life coach. I was going down that route and it opened up all those sorts of things. And I was looking on my own. I have I was able to reflect it on my own practice with as a, you know, as a nursery teacher and recognizing sort of the correlation between the two. And I was really interested in how I could uh, sort of bring it down to a, a level where it was more associated with children and then I developed I found the course and I just went into it and it was it just really underpins everything that you don't recognize that you're doing I think sometimes I think that the, when we have when we're in our roles we just do our jobs um not and I don't mean that in a in a, in a throwaway way I mean that she would just we get so used to what we're doing Instinct. we don't recognize the skills that we've got and we don't recognize uh, all the little nuances that are having an impact, whether negative or positive, on our, on our children every day. So when I started to train as a as a trauma informed practitioner, it really did highlight lots of things. That I think actually, we were I was doing already, and my team were doing already. But actually, how we could change uh, our phrasing, how we could soften our postures, how we could become safe places in ourselves, and it just sort of evolved from that and you just sort of recognize the bits that you're doing and how you can make those better and and the things that you're not doing and then you know where you go where you think you're doing the best thing because everybody always comes with the best of intention but actually you can make a situation worse yeah oh no so that, that, makes, identify that yeah that makes sense it's it's that bit yeah I, I, I was saying like thinking about it whilst you were talking there it's like we do our jobs not, not on autopilot but by instinct and like you, you know a child's upset and you want to help them and you want to know why it's just things that we do yes but we don't recognize that actually this is 
what it's part of. Yes, exactly. And sometimes as well, um, inadvertently, if a child is upset, we can try and placate them by saying, oh, it's okay, you're okay, because we want to make them feel better. But actually, inadvertently, we're not making them feel better because they're obviously not okay. Do you know? So it's like little things Mm. like that that actually help you recognize how you can, it's just validating the children so that they, it's changing your phrasing and how you approach and respond to certain situations that children then can feel seen and heard and their feelings are validated Mm -hmm. um, and acknowledging. And it could be, oh, you're really upset. So it could be just a a simple change of phrase that is all makes all the difference to that child rather than, oh, you're okay. You know, you're all right. Because they're obviously not. Do, Do you know what I mean? You're doing it in a loving way, but actually inadvertently you're sort of dismissing what's happening to them and how they're feeling in that moment and I know that sounds quite pedantic I don't mean it to be quite pedantic because you know these sort of things happen all the time and we can't be on it 24 7 it's just not possible we're not going to get it right 100% of the time but is that awareness of what you're saying and how you're saying it or how you're approaching something that makes all the difference yeah definitely I think it's as well it's empowering the children with Uh that they need to describe what's happening what they're feeling absolutely so that kind of led you on as well, like that was that was a nice little segue there uh, into developing a course for, was it for practitioners to to deliver to children or was it to be delivered to children? The- well, I've developed several courses. Uh, my most recent one is Neuro Navigators, which is about bringing the concepts of brain science to help develop uh, and provide emotional and behavioral support. So, and I'm I'm a great believer of including children in what's happening. Um, because I think if you, again, you empower them, if you tell them what is happening and what is going on, then they can, they have an opportunity to respond to that. So it sort of falls on the back of the pedagogy because no pencil required is a pedagogy I sort of developed. I didn't know it was called no pencil required until two years ago. Um, but on the back of that, I've created the con- the conscious practitioner course, which is where the practitioner is very aware of their role because we, Children are always, you know, we're very child centered and children come first. And I'm not sort of bringing away from that, but I really believe that um, the teachers and the practitioners actually come first because I think if you aren't in the best place, you can't give your best for those children. So it's not to say that the children aren't, you know, it's, you know, it's really close. (laughs) I'm not saying I'm not bringing away from the children at all, but I really do believe that actually you are so valuable in your roles and you're not given, you don't give yourself enough um, uh, sort of praise or recognition for what you bring. And we get caught up in in everything that comes on and the stress that brings up, well, you know, you've, you have explained earlier on, you know, yourself, you've experienced it this week. And that's just a norm, you know, you just get on with that, but it takes its toll. And I think the conscious practitioner really does highlight you and how important you are and ways to take care of yourself so that you can give your best, you can be the best teacher version of you. Yeah. And that that is super important as well, because if we're not, mm taking that time for ourselves and we we do as a staff team as well we talk about that in fact one of my one of my team is also one that nags me to make sure you had your break because yeah. I'm, I'm terrible I will make sure that they're okay but actually am I okay yeah I don't tend to think about that as well so it, I, I suppose it's highlighting the fact that every single individual within that setting is important children yes. and adults alike yeah. And, you know, and because they because you've got such an important role, and you want to look after everybody. If you're not filling your own cup, you're not going to be able to look after everybody the way that you want to, mm-hmm. you know, or it's going to cost you in order to give to them. And that's not to say that they're not worthy of that. But actually, it's not it's, it's that change in that mindset of actually, it's not selfish to put yourself first, if it means that you're giving more to others, mm-hmm. you know, and it's changing that because we can feel guilty about that. And it's we shouldn't feel guilty about that. It's really important that we look after ourselves because we cannot give what we want to give to others if we don't do that. It's that thing, isn't it? You've got to fill your own cup. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us, you, you mentioned a little bit about neuro navigators there. Tell us a yeah. little bit more about this one. This sounds quite exciting because I, <sighs> I, I do love a bit about brain science and, and neuroscience. That's kind of my my little uh, my little excitement part. Yeah. And I'm learning so much about it. Do you know, it just, this just makes me feel so good. I just love this so much. And, and I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm not a neurobiologist. I'm not, you know, I'm just a nursery teacher, an ex-nursery teacher from Devon who believes in helping children um, 
to just not be misunderstood. And I really believe that with, if, like I was saying earlier, you know, autonomy and self-advocacy for children is so important because so much is done to children um, with our routines and our expectations, the chivvy here, the chivvy there, we're going to do this activity, we're going to join in, you know, they, there's very little that they get to choose for themselves. But neuro navigators, and because we now know, you know, I've got, I support a lot of teachers and practitioners, and I am, you know, a lot of messages all the time of behavior is seems to be, you know, getting more challenging, more tricky. It's really difficult for children, for teachers and practitioners to be able to support the children in the best of ways so if you can do it in a way that actually the children are you know given ownership they're given the understanding and you we can do and I know this works because now I've developed this course I recognize the practice that I did with my children in my class you know we we did it wasn't called neuro navigators then we just built our bodies and brains and they knew what was happening inside of them they recognized it was like you said earlier about giving them the language to identify what's happening in order for them to be able to recognize it and do something about it so it just builds on that so it's a three-tier system it's actually a whole primary school program so we've got the brain buds which are your nursery reception we've got your do you know what my brain's gone let me just read i've got it written down here the brain builders club is key stage one and then we've got the thought transformers which is key stage two so it's at different levels of understanding so that you can actually reach those children so from tiny three-year-olds you can start introducing the concepts but it's getting them to understand you know how things are presenting in their bodies when we've got children who are throwing things doesn't necessarily mean because they're angry you know they could be scared do you know what i mean it's, it's recognizing why they're presenting the way that they're presenting and helping them understand. And certainly, I think if we can help children understand that there's nothing wrong with them, they're not broken, you know, it's just their brains trying to keep them safe. And if we can show them how to do that and give them the tools with which to recognize and respond and deal with that, we teach them those amazing self-regulation skills that everybody goes on about because we can co-regulate with them in a really great way. So these, you know, it's really interactive. We give them concepts to understand. And then if we get children, if we get that from young and then the children, as they go through the school, if that's fostered all the way through the school, then, you know, the level of anxiety will drop because children will know what's happening. They'll be able to recognize it will have such a, a sort of transcendent effect on them in their life learning and success, not just in their school learning and success. And I think and then when you think about them, you know, when they go on to teenage years, they would have had that grounding and it will really set them up for for um, for what's to come. It's yeah. interesting that you said about teenagers as well. And I think that that's part of it because we haven't really taken the time. It, you know, we've gone through this process like, you know, I've been doing this for almost 27 years um, and, you, you know, you, you've been doing the same. And it wasn't really talked about it wasn't that thing it's like oh you know it it was almost like oh well you'll be fine on you go move along now um but actually it's kind of stunted a little bit with with older children and teenagers that they don't actually know how to describe how they're feeling so starting now you know as as early as we can to sort of name it and you know describe what it's feeling and what it's about actually talking about emotions Mm. is super important I know some people think oh well it's all a bit airy fairy but actually it's so important because we're in this colossal bag of stuff that just walks around and if we don't understand what's going on in our own body then how can we expect children to kind of regulate themselves because they they can't it's impossible No, absolutely. And it's really important as well that, you know, that we develop it through connection and compassion and kindness and relationship, because trust is really key. Children need to feel safe in order for them to be able to be what you want them to be. And if you've got children who are coming in, um, you can have children who come from really nurturing environments, really loving families who actually have had everything done and they've never had to uh, experience anything negative or have to solve a problem, who then can't cope because they have you know they're not able to do they're not they discover that you know and I don't mean this in a a horrible way you know because we do we we 
we revere our children. We absolutely adore them. And we, and we think that they are the most amazing things. And they come in with that. And because children are, we know young children are naturally egotistical anyway. Yeah. But when they then recognize actually, well, mommy and daddy have said, I'm amazing. I can do anything, but I'm stuck here. And they haven't had any skills in order to develop that. Then that can have an impact just as much as children who've had a dysregulated background, who have been given the most awful names and have, have had the most awful experiences, who come in so guarded that they cannot develop a relationship of mm-hmm. trust because adults don't bring that. Why Why would they even begin that? So they come in uh, with it's different types of resilience, really. You know, the, they've got the resilience from the dysregulated where they've got to treat themselves safe. And it's a really negative thing. And then there's a lack of resilience from the ones who have had everything done because they've been loved so much that, every, you know, they've never had to experience anything. So it's developing opportunities for uh building that trust and that level of safety. Because when children, it comes down to three things pretty much. When children do experience sort of big baffling behaviors, it is a lack of of connection, a lack of feeling of safety and regulation, you know? And regulation as well, I think that gets confused because regulation isn't calm. It isn't about being calm. It's about being in control of what's happening to you. And you can't control it if you don't know what it is. So Neuro Navigators helps children and identify what it is so that it helps to build on self-regulation it gives them really great tools in which to do that and the beautiful thing about everything that i do all aspects of no pencil required is you don't need any extra resources for it i'm a huge believer that everything you have is right there with you it's in you it's in those children you don't need to laminate anything you don't need to plan anything you don't need to print anything it's just taking the time to understand it and then it's like having this this toolbox filled with stuff that you can just pull out at times of transition at times of children who are experiencing big feelings you know at time of great times of tricky times you just have this tool of stuff that you can just pull out and give a go and see if it's going to work mm-hmm. but just by understanding what's happening in front of you I think that's, that's another important thing as well about the understanding yourself I mean what I was I was lucky enough. I did the the sort of the level two, the very the you know the introduction to neuroscience course, and I'm so glad I did because I was working with two year olds at the time, and the two year olds happened to be my favourite age group. <laughs> up them to pieces. They're just this baffling array of you know this. There's a lot of wow wees, isn't it, when you're two? <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, so much going on with them. It's just yeah. amazing. But sometimes, like when their behaviour just it, you know to 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 borrow a phrase when they kick off yeah understand what's going on with them and i'm like okay do i understand what's going but i found that actually by taking that time so like you were saying there about building our own skills and our own knowledge Mm -hmm. that by building my knowledge about what's going on with their heads and their emotions and the sort of the lack of uh regulation and everything that really helped me to understand so the next time one of the two-year-olds had a, a had a, a fit about something. Um, somebody took something off them, and they threw themselves on the ground. Instead of going, "Now you're okay. We're just going to share and all that," which I've previously done, and you know, I will hold my hands up and say, "Yes, I did that," but I didn't know any better at the time. Well, this is it. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And then the thing is, though, is when you discover what you don't know, you start to know what you don't know, and that can make you feel really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so you have two choices then you can decide to get comfortable being uncomfortable and do something about it or you get comfortable and you go back to safety and you carry on doing what you were doing but there's a great quote by henry ford and it's if you always do what you've always done you always get what you've always got so when you've got people who are constantly up against um if we say explosive behaviors big behaviors and they keep on doing the same old thing and it's not working then there comes a point of where, where do you go from here? Do you keep on, you know, knocking against the buffer or do you actually go, do you know what we need to do something about this? Because it takes the same amount of energy to deal with the fallout as it does to put the steps in place. The reason it feels harder is because it's new and it's different and you have to be hyper aware of it. And that makes it feel like it's really hard. It's not, it's just different. Mm -hmm. So it's changing that mindset. That's the conscious practitioner. That's you as the teacher, changing that mindset around that and recognizing that there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. It just feels really hard because it's really new and you're hyper aware of it Mm -hmm. as you bring that in, but get comfortable with that. And it soon becomes, the way that you do it and the beautiful thing about that is when you start changing your approach like that everybody's watching you 
Mm. You know, you don't need training programs in, a, in a, and I don't mean that in a, in a horrible sense because I do training programs, but actually you become such a role model. You become a role model for your colleagues because they start picking up on the nuances mm. and the children see you. They see you respond to those children who may normally have a, a negative label, uh, mm. may normally have real difficulties forming friendships in their peer groups, but when they see you respond with kindness, and compassion and understanding and you use that language you know yeah they're really struggling right now they just need an extra bit of love and they hear that and they see that it 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 teaches them that that's what they do because you're going to treat them exactly the same you know you foster those uh communities of everybody wants those classroom communities that actually have this great ethos of kindness and friendship and compassion understanding but children don't know these concepts because well why would they they need to they need to see those concepts they may not know the labels for them but they need to see the actions in order for them to be what it is we tell them to be no don't hit your friends use kind hands okay what does that actually mean you do, do you know what i mean it's it's really how you respond is how they'll respond and then the child who's having the most difficulty will have this classroom filled of kind souls who are doing their best to understand. And that doesn't mean no boundaries. It doesn't mean that, you know, that there aren't expectations because, it, you know, you want socially adept individuals. You want them to understand what the expectations are in your settings. But boundaries aren't consequences. It's a big, just a different debate, but a big difference there too. No, absolutely. I mean, so that, that particular child, when, you know, when I adjusted my practice, my attitude was, well, I'm not going to tell them to, you know, give it back because they took something off. So they were having their meltdown. So I just lay down next to them. Mm -hmm. And that's all I did. I didn't okay. say anything straight away. I just lay down next to them. And then when they calmed down, I said, would you like a cuddle? Yeah. Got to cuddle and they calmed right down. And then we talked about it because yeah. we had to acknowledge what had happened. Yes. And I think Absolutely. that was very important, but it was, it was one of those bits that, you know, if we're reflecting on how we are as practitioners and when we realize like, I'm not, something's not right here. What do I need to change? And then you look at other things and look, at, I'm a big advocate for CPD and ongoing learning because yeah. we never, ever stop. You know, the whole landscape of early years changes so often. Um, and like the way children are as well, I feel they, they change as well because society yeah. changes. So their attitudes change and parenting styles change and everything else. Um, so it's, we have to keep changing. We have to keep adapting. Absolutely. And I think as well, we're exposed to so much more and everything's more accessible. So there's lots of things on, on social media and there's so much, it can become a bit of a noise too. And it's hard to know what to do for the best. And we take little bits and, and when we think, well, it, actually this is, this doesn't work. This is just rubbish. This is just nonsense. This is airy fairy without recognizing what's going on behind it or what it actually really means. We just see something and we think, oh, actually, we're going to try that. I, you know, I've been guilty of that. It's it's just, you know, we all do. And it's it's just making sense of the noise and actually recognizing what's really important. I created something that I call the no pencil required lens and it helps you see the wow behind the ordinary. And it just helps you to, you know, look, at, instead of seeing what you can see is actually, what can I see? You know, you just look that little bit behind, a little bit behind, exactly like you said, because when you've got a child who is as dysregulated as that, they're not going to hear you. There is nothing that you can do or say that is going to get through to that child. You're just adding fuel to the fire. And, and I'm sure that there are loads of people listening that would know that. But actually, when you're caught in the moment and because you want to keep everybody safe and you want to stop it from happening because you feel so uncomfortable because, you know, it's triggering something in you. Uh -huh. And so you don't like it and you want it to stop, that actually it takes longer to stop because you're inadvertently, by trying your best, you're making it worse. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's it. I think that's that was the the, the sort of the, the changing moment for me when I eventually realised it's like, by, I'm constantly talking at them. And, you know, I will, I will honestly say that phrase, I was talking at them. I wasn't talking to them, I was talking at them. And it, it just wasn't working. So that's when I had to change my practice because it wasn't meeting their needs. No. And we do it. You know, it's just, it, 
And we're not going to do, you know, it's easy to sit here and talk about all the things that are so wonderful and that we should do. But let's, you know, we're human. It's, we got to talk about life. And there are so many things that get chucked at us. And we're not going to get it right all of the time. We've got to cut ourselves some slack. You know, that is OK. But if you know that you are aware and you are doing your very best, that's all anybody can do. You know, is that actually in those moments when you are ultimately aware and you really are on it and you get it right, that those are wins. Do you know, and they sort of it gives you a really good balance because the more of you that do that, and then you've got, like I said, you're the role model, the more of your team that do that. How many successes is that in a week? You know, and it's actually recognizing all the little positive bits that you do. Yeah, I, I definitely think that. I mean, after doing the course, some of my colleagues were like I was talking to them about what I'd learned and and everything else and how I was putting it into practice, and they were watching, and it's like, okay, it's a different approach. Um, and part of my role in this is in my previous setting, not in my current setting, but in my previous setting, I was what was called the advanced skills practitioner, which was my fancy job title for the fact I'm old and I know stuff. <laughs> That's the way I describe it because it's the easiest way of describing what my job title was. But it, <laughs> yeah, staff would watch me and like, well, what's this about? Or oh, they come and ask me stuff. And that's where, like you say, it's like being that role model for other team yeah. members. Uh, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, th this is what I've learned and this is what I'm discovering from it. You know, this is what's not working for me. This is what I'm putting in place to try and change my my work, you know, and what I yeah. do. And it's hard as well because, you know, change is difficult. Not everybody likes change. And you can have, uh, you know, you can be incredibly skilled. I thought myself of a really skilled teacher until I went to a PE class and I realized how inept some of these children that I'd sent them off. And I thought I'd done a really good job. And it really upset me to think actually that, you know, I hadn't set them up for this PE class as well as I thought I'd done. And that really got me on a on a bit of a journey. But I think we can be incredibly skilled and I'm not taking that away from anybody. We can have so much experience and we, you know, you can be incredibly good at what you do. But because you are, it becomes uh, like a routine. You don't have to think. Mm -hmm. It just becomes what you do. And the danger of that is then, even though it may work, all your cohorts are different. You know, everything that they bring with them each time is different. So mm -hmm. even though your approach remains the same, it's going to land differently on who you've got. And that's why you're going to have bigger roller coaster bumps, because you if you if you're not prepared to think uh, or step up and think more about what's going on in front of you you're still going to get those buffers and it's going to become you know a really unpleasant experience and and I you know I would put money on everybody listening to this everybody in early years they don't want to be that type of practitioner but you know that's not what they're there for they're not that type of teacher they want their children to have the best learning experiences but sometimes we can get in our own way and not recognize when it's down to us to make the difference. I think it's that bit about routine when it be everything starts to become routine. Mm. You should really question why is it routine? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's nothing wrong with routines and having, because they can provide um, security and children can know what's happening next, which is great. But if you're so rigid in, you know, not in your just your day to day routine, but in the way that you practice stuff with you, you know, if you've been doing the same job for 20 years and you know every September, this is how you do it like this and your plans start the same way. Your children coming in aren't the same children as last year or 10 years ago. And like you were saying, you know, children and society and parenting has altered so much that there are massive changes coming through. There are such just, you know, discrepancies with children's capabilities and understanding and levels of development coming through that have all been impacted on COVID, which we can't, dis you know, we can't excuse that has had a massive impact, but oh. there's less playtime, there's less, you know, there's more screen time. And we've got to recognise actually that is the sign of the time that is where we are right now. And what worked five, 10 years ago, as great as they're out there, you know, and some of those things might work today, but they're not all going to work. So it's how can you, you know, what what is it that you need to do in order to be able to use what you know to support what you don't know and make those changes and, and be ready to do that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it was funny. You, you just brought back a memory to me there of um, a setting that I used to kind of visit quite regularly. And it was it was that bit where they were it was kind of their security blanket. It would be the same type of planning. And I could literally guarantee if I went to visit them every couple of years at the same time of year, the same display board would be up and it would be exactly the same carbon copies of everything. There was no individuality. And it was just down to 
I don't know whether it was down to their lack of experience because they'd all been doing it for forever. But maybe mm. that's the problem. They, they were doing it. Yes. For, so it just became their security blanket. This is what we're doing at this time of year. And if th- there was no change in what they were doing to meet the needs of the children that they had mm. at the time. And it's I, I think it's that hugely important bit that we need to look at our individual children. And I'm a big believer mm. that in my own setting that every single child that comes to us is different. And mm. luckily, the team that I've got with me are totally on board with that, that we don't do massive loads of planning because it's not what we're about. We don't know what the children are going to want to do from yeah. one to the next. So we go with that. And I think it was, it, it was difficult for them at first, but they made the change because I, I slowly explained to them and, and kind of modeled it. It's like children are going to change what their minds are set on every five minutes and you yeah. can't plan so far in advance but you can do little invitations and provocations and things like that and see where they go with it. Just don't be precious about it. Let them let them run with it and see where it goes. I think so. And I think sometimes as well, we hear the topic understanding the world. I've got a bit of a beam up on it about this. I believe, and I don't, I don't dispute that actually, it's really nice to expose children to other experiences, but actually for children to understand abstract and outside of their world, you need to teach them understanding their world. And it's right meeting them where they are right in that moment. So I think it's understanding their world before they can have any concept of understanding the world, because they need to know who they are and where they fit. It's all about identity and where they are in that space. And their world right now is their classroom, their family, where they are in that environment, you know, where they are in that moment. And I think because they do live in the moment, excuse me, (laughs) as much as we try and think not, they are very much in that moment. And it's not to say that we can't give them wonderful experiences, but we've got to understand when we introduce those experiences, one, who we're doing it for, and and what are they going to get from that if they are still not really making sense of where they are and, you know, why they're doing what they're doing at that moment. And I think understanding their world comes before understanding the world. That makes absolute sense to me as well, because we, I mean, we mentioned it earlier that children are essentially egocentric beings. Yes. That's what they are. That's that, that is their programming to, if you, if you like that, you know, the, their world basically revolves around them. Mm-hmm. So, that that is currently their world and we need to understand that and go with that yeah. to help them understand that actually there's more beyond that you yeah. know to look beyond it to see what there it is. is but and we most of that... be with them first yeah absolutely sorry i overspoke you know i do apologize but i think once you recognize that and then realize actually understanding their world and beyond that is actually how they can get on with the person that's next to them in that room you know that takes them beyond that world if they're in that moment and they're right there how they relate to that person who's right next to them on that chair is extending that world because you want to develop that those personal and uh, interpersonal skills you want to develop um you know when you talk about empathy and understanding with it those are massive things that come way down the line but you can start and that's where it comes to modeling like you were saying like you model the way that you want to approach things with your children and that's exactly the thing that you do in order for them to start to evolve outside of that really because it's really small and we we don't um give it thought perhaps you know or not enough thought in order for them we just assume they're going to get on there right we're going to come over here now we're going to do this now we're going to line up over here we're going to have carpet time and for the most part they just get along and they have a really nice time and they enjoy it But for those, you know, those children who find that difficult, if we're not recognising where they are in that moment, then we can be creating situations that we could actually avoid. Absolutely. Well, Teresa, unfortunately, time is against us and we've Uh reached the end of this podcast. But thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely amazing. I've loved it. Thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed talking with you this evening, Glenn. Thank you. Teresa Robinson, thank you. Take care.